Hey everyone, today on the final bar, the risk off rotation continues as utilities, the sole sector out of the 11, closing up for the day. Jessica Inskip of Options Play is going to be joining us, showing us why the equal weighted S&P may be an important chart to watch. Finally, two key stocks sporting the dreaded head and shoulders topping pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny and hot Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the Technical Analysis Toolkit. Technical Analysis really is designed to empower investors to better understand the markets, to better respect the message of market psychology and investor sentiment, and really focusing on the trends. A lot of what we do, I feel, as technical analysts is focus on what's working and focus on what's not working. Keeping it simple as much as we can. My conversation yesterday with Dave Landry really focused on simplifying, focusing on trend and simple measurements of trend. Can we make that basic assessment of whether something is going up, down, or sideways? We don't have to get too complicated. Let's start there and then build more and more uh, rigor and uh, discipline to our decision-making process. So where are we at today? Well, we continue to see that risk-off sort of environment. The S&P and the NASDAQ both closing lower. Only one of the 11 S&P sectors managing to finishing, finish in the green, and it's not an offensive one. It's utilities, which is arguably one of the more defensive places uh, we can come up with. So a lot of things testing the 50-day, a lot of things, unfortunately, breaking the 50-day, including the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. We're going to get to all those charts and more here as we get started with our market recap. Before we get to the recap and the, uh, and the individual charts, I do want to share with you a poll question that we had recently on our social media accounts. Of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. You won't miss the next poll. And we asked you recently, where will Amazon, A-M-Z-N, be one month from today? 10% higher, 10% lower, or within 10% of current levels? Now, there is a reason why I'm asking this sort of question with our guest today, Jessica Inskip who is one of our uh, options experts that it's a pleasure to bring on the show because if you have the options capabilities, if you have those sorts of levers you can pull, you can start to think about betting on prices going X percent higher or X percent lower or staying within a particular range. And I'm very interested to see two things. Number one, pretty widespread between all of these options. We're seeing some bulls and some bears and a number of people in the middle. But the most common answer, 41 percent of you said within 10 percent of current levels. Put another way, we don't go very far. And again, the good thing about the options market is you have some options, uh, pun intended, on what you can do if that's your expectation. But at the end of the day, what can we see when we're looking at the chart of Amazon? Amazon is one of those where if I'm looking at sort of the growth space and I'm trying to pick a name that really isn't that bad yet, Amazon might be the one I would bring up because you have signs of being in the later stages or the later innings of an uptrend. I think most obviously, in June and July, as you see the market making new highs and even the uh, subsequent high in August, all met with lower momentum. So when a stock is going higher on stronger momentum, like Amazon in March, April, May into June, that's more constructive. That tells you every time we're making new highs, there's more and more upward momentum behind that price movement. When things start to slow down, sort of at the later stages of the game, you start to see uh, divergences where the market's going higher, but the, the uh, momentum characteristics actually start to slope lower. I think that's what you saw in June into mid-July, uh, and again, making a gap higher in August, but the momentum really not becoming overbought again. So I think that's a cause for concern. But how bad has Amazon got, really gotten? Not that bad yet, right? We're still holding the 50-day moving average. Amazon and Alphabet stand out to me as some of the uh, FANG stocks that actually found support at the 50-day and bounced higher. Kind of the opposite to what you saw from Apple and Microsoft, some of those key leading technology names that broke down through their 50-day, along with some of the semiconductor names and others we could, uh, we could go through. Amazon's still holding in there. Concern, I guess, the last concern with Amazon is the gap higher and then that's it, right? When you have a gap like this, it's always interesting to see what happens immediately after. If you see a gap higher to new highs for the year and then further upside, that tells you not only did we jump up in valuations overnight, we actually see additional buyers coming in, pushing the price higher. When you gap upwards and then that's it, and then that's the high watermark, that tells you that all of that excitement, all of that optimism, all that buying power kind of priced in, and now we're sort of sagging back down, which tells you everyone that bought in there, there's no additional buyers pushing us higher. And that is concerning about the longevity, or I guess the upside momentum, the, the further upside beyond what we've seen so far. 
But again, a chart like Amazon not broken yet. If I had to vote, I probably would agree. 10% of current levels actually gives you pretty wide, uh, pretty wide range there, but but also gives plenty of movement to be uh, to be had within those uh, extremes. Thanks so much for answering that uh, poll question. Uh, make sure you uh, follow us on social media, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss the next poll. Let's keep going with our market recap today and focus on what we learned about the markets in today's trading session. As I mentioned, a bit of a risk off pattern continuing today. The S and P down about 0.8%. Uh, closing just above 4,400. And what's interesting, we've been talking about 4,500 as sort of that uh, you know perceived short-term resistance. We've had a couple attempts to get above 4,500, really haven't materialized much beyond there. Now we're talking about the next sort of 100 count below there, around 4,400. Not a major support level, uh, I think all things considered, but you know, as we start to, uh, you know, as we fail to hold these big round numbers, I get less and less excited about uh, the market conditions overall. The Nasdaq, uh, even worse, down about 1.2 percent today. The Nasdaq uh, 100, uh, excuse me, the Nasdaq Composite, that is uh, below 13,500 now today. Mid caps and small caps down as well. And the small cap S and P 600 having the worst day of all, down 1.2 percent. The only green we see on our list of uh, of major equity. Indexes and indicators is the VIX, which is sort of a contrary indicator. Uh, volatility increasing, still below a 17 handle, but uh, up around 16.8, which again, pretty high relative to where we've been uh, for the last two to three months. Let's look at some other asset classes here very quickly. Bonds selling off again today. So uh, this is that pattern where you see both stocks and bonds rotating lower. Interest rates moving higher. And again, uh, uh, you have some uh, discussion about uh, the Fed, as always, expectations. No August meeting, but there is a September meeting, subsequent meetings through the end of, uh, of this year. What sort of pause do we have in rates? Is there, are there any additional hikes, which I'm now hearing discussion of uh, sort of toward the end of this year? Uh, are we in a position at all where we can talk about rates coming down in 2024? Doesn't seem to be the case just yet. Uh, and uh, for now, we're seeing rates go higher. Ten-year yield now above four and a quarter, finishing the day uh, right around 426. And again, there's no reason why uh, interest rates can't stop going up in terms of a particular level. Just because we hit four and a quarter doesn't mean we can't go to four and a half percent or even five percent. Those are all possibilities. Um, so again, a rising rate environment, I think, is a reality. The bad news for our growth-oriented benchmarks is rising rates doesn't tend to be great for growth stocks. And our benchmarks are very geared toward growth. The dollar uh, up about a third of a percent, so not a huge, uh, crazy update, but uh, certainly up while a lot of other things are down. The commodity space down uh, a little further today. We had our YouTube live Q&A earlier today, which was a lot of fun. Had some questions about the commodity space. We looked at some of the commodity ETFs like DBC, uh, DBA, the agriculture ETF, and uh, others. Precious metals down today. Gold and silver both down about a half a percent. Uh, if not a little bit more, the GLD continues to rotate lower. And when I'm scanning for stocks making new swing highs and new swing lows, now I just kind of assume I'm going to find Newmont and RGLD and gold, Barrick Gold and others sort of uh, popping up there. They did not disappoint today. They were right where I expected on the new swing lows list, continuing to not really find support, but breaking down and uh, now testing pretty long-term support levels. Finally, cryptocurrencies for the most part in the red, not by much for the majors, though. Bitcoin uh, currently just above 29,100, just about a quarter of a percent below yesterday. And Ether price is around 1820. That's down about 0.4 percent uh, from the end of the uh, trading day yesterday. Let's look at the uh, sorry. Actually, let's look at the sectors here really quick. As I mentioned in the intro, utilities having a, uh, a an update when everything else was down. And again, I don't feel great about the markets when utilities are at the top of the list. Not the end of the world. There are times when utilities and other defensive sectors can outperform during uh, bullish phases. However, much more likely uh, that that's more of a, uh, a defensive positioning. So utilities, financials, consumer staples, the top three performers, although financials and staples both down slightly for the day. At the bottom of the list, you have the XLY and the XLC Two of the FANG sectors uh, down uh, about 1.2, 1.3%. Real estate as well down 1.2%. Let's so look, look at a daily chart of the S&P, just kind of check in on where we're at. So this is what happened on today. So if you think about the last couple days on this show, uh, two days ago, we're talking about the 50-day moving average, really on Friday's show. We kind of traded lower through the course of the week. Big line in the sand for me is the 50-day moving average. Can we hold the 50-day? And if so, then this is just a brief tactical pullback. The next leg higher, pretty clear, and we can continue to sort of see this long-term uptrend uh, and really the cyclical uptrend continuing. 
We failed to hold the 50-day moving average. That's where we have to get concerned. On yesterday's show, we're talking about a close below the 50-day for the S&P and for the NASDAQ 100. Concerning, but not the end of the world. We just need to see if we have a follow-through day the next day, which would be today. And we certainly did get a follow-through day. We closed near the lows of the day. The S&P now testing 4,400. That means I would argue we have now have a valid uh, breakdown below the 50-day moving average. Now, that for me is sort of the line in the sand. What I mentioned is uh, sort of over the last couple of weeks, when you have a market in an uptrend and you start to pull back, instead of checking every day, which I think opens yourself up to a lot of behavioral biases, just sort of you know confirmation bias and endowment bias and narrative bias, all these things that sort of cloud your perspective, what I like to do is just set a level, right? What's the line? What's the level? What's the moving average? What's the point? at which you agree that the, the pattern has now broken down, you need to revisit some long positions or revisit your overall appetite for risk. For me, that 4450 level, which is about the 50-day moving average, also a trend line connecting the May, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the March and the May lows, all kind of coalescing around that same point. I think that level's now broken, which means if you haven't thought about downside protection, you haven't thought about what it means to your portfolio. If the S&P goes to 4,300 or 4,200 or even 3,800, I'm not saying that's definitely going to happen, but I was taught all large losses begin as small losses. If you can focus on keeping your losses small and recognizing and sort of taking risk off when things start to get bad, then you uh, minimize the opportunity or minimize the, uh, the chance that you hold things way longer than you want to. Selling late can be really painful on the way down, I'll be honest with you. From personal experience, as most investors tend to uh, have, you have the scars from earlier in your inv investing career. So I think now is the time, certainly, if you've not thought about uh, you know, downside protection, what your portfolio might look like, what sort of changes you may want to think about making, this would be a really good time to uh, have those sorts of thoughts. As the technical picture, I would argue, continues to uh, deteriorate, we start to break some uh, potential support levels here. Just to finish off our market recap, I mentioned in terms of breadth conditions. We hit on breadth pretty regularly, but you know, it's worth noting that as of uh, you know, today, 41% of the S&P members above their 50-day moving average. Late July, about three weeks ago, that same uh, indicator was at about 90%. That's the panel at the bottom. What that means is about half of the S&P 500 members, about 250 names, were above their 50-day about three weeks ago and are now below their 50-day moving average. So when you see the S&P, the QQQ, breaking the 50-day, it's not just that. This is a broader rotation with a lot of stocks failing to hold, I would argue, a really fundamental level of support. So again, when, I, when, you, when you hear sort of a negative, sort of a cautious uh, uh, tone to my voice, probably comes from reviewing a lot of individual stocks and breadth conditions, kind of lining up with previous market uh, topping patterns. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but certainly means you want to start thinking defensively if you've not uh, yet. Before you think that I'm all defensive and not optimistic, I'm actually naturally a very optimistic person, to be honest with you. Uh, let's find some stocks that are breaking higher. Here's one just off the top of my head. Look for apparel retailers, right? This is a group that's actually holding up. I do think it's an interesting exercise to scan for stocks making new highs and new lows. And I don't do 52-week highs. I actually look more at three-month highs or 13-week highs and lows because a lot of times that can uh, help you identify things just a little earlier on. Things just starting to rotate higher. Things just starting to rotate lower. And I find that being aware of that group of names that are in those uh, buckets can be very, very helpful for recognizing shifts in leadership and recognizing what I call a change of character, where the market has a certain feel, and all of a sudden that picture starts to change for whatever reason. It's worth noting at a time when you find downside rotation is more the norm, what are the stocks and groups that are actually holding up? Which are the ones that are testing resistance and actually breaking through to the upside? That can be an interesting bucket of stocks to work with because they are undoubtedly outperforming, meaning the relative performance is really starting to improve because everything else is going down. Most things are going down, they're actually holding up okay. TJX is an example. Raw stores, other names are uh, in that group are ones that are actually breaking out of basing patterns. I would argue that TJX was in an accumulation phase, higher highs and higher lows through the end of last year. Then sort of this basing pattern or a consolidation uh, phase, sort of this sideways period in the first half of 2023. Now, of course, it underperforms during that period because most things are actually doing quite well in the first half of this year. Then look at how we rotate it higher. June, July, now August, all positive months, making a new high uh, every month, while other things are really starting to struggle. Uh, gapping higher today, which again, for me in this environment, tells me, okay, hold on, let's see if you get additional buyers coming in after that move higher. But overall, higher highs and higher lows are bullish, and TJX is one of those few stocks actually managing to, uh, to do that. 
All right, that's it for the optimism. Let's get a little more real and talk about the, uh, the stocks that are struggling. It's interesting, First Solar is one of the uh, technology names not broken, right? I think these are names that are bending. Uh, you know, the, the uptrend phase, I would argue, for now is over, at least on pause. Again, if you think about the market in three different phrase, phases, and, and for me, it's an accumulation phase, meaning uh, higher highs and higher lows, a consolidation phase, which is sideways, which means basically a pretty consistent level of resistance and level of support, and then a downtrend phase, which would be we start breaking down, we're making lower lows and lower highs. First Solar is an example of one of those names. It's actually sort of in that sideways phase, I think a consolidation phase. You have clear resistance around 220 to 230, now clear support around 170, 180, the 200-day moving average kind of right around there as well. So I think we're right at that point where the next leg is kind of uncertain, but what's great about a chart like this is you have some clear levels to watch, right? Do we either break out of this range to the upside, finally breaking above resistance and following through, or do we finally break down through support? And instead of just pausing uh, an uptrend, actually show signs of a new downtrend. I think this might be an important chart to watch. Set some alerts to capture a breakout to the upside or a breakout to the downside. I don't know from this chart just yet which way I would vote is happening. I think it's helpful to be patient and sort of wait for the opportunity to come. Let's see which way this thing uh, might break. Finally, a lot of questions about gaps earlier in our, uh, in our live Q&A on YouTube. And two of the charts that we looked at, Humana and uh, Raytheon RTX. I'll show you each of those. Gaps, I think, are really helpful because what happens after a gap can be really informational or really uh, important, in my, in my opinion. So if you look at Humana in the healthcare space, we gapped higher. This is creating what we call an island uh, reversal, which is a gap lower, a bunch of stuff, and then a gap back higher, kind of closing that out. It's not ideal, but that's the general kind of pattern uh, that I'm seeing here. But what's more important to me is that we gapped higher and then continue to push to the upside. So think about what a gap means. That means from one day's close to the next day open, something happens, right? Some reason for investors to think of this as a very different price level uh, as justified by some news event or earnings usually, uh, or whatever it is. But then additional buyers have come in, and so we've pushed higher over the last uh, couple weeks. Stalled out a little bit here at the 200-day moving average, which I would watch, but overall, gaps higher with upside follow-through can be really meaningful. Compare that to something like Raytheon, a gap lower, we really haven't regained any ground from there. We're actually rotating lower still. We're sort of chopping around. So this is a chart telling you that stock's worth about $86, $87 a share and no reason to be anything other than that. That is not a bullish development, right? You want to see when new buyers come in, chart like this, break out of that range, break above 88, start to fill that gap. That could be a more encouraging development for now. Not quite yet. Folks, that's our market recap for today. A lot of charts and a lot of uh, things to talk about as, again, we see this uh, further rotation to the downside. We have a great guest today, uh, Jessica Inskip. I'm going to bring her on momentarily. Before we do, a couple of quick announcements. We're going to do an all mailbag show this Friday, and we would love to feature your questions in our mailbag. We've had so many great questions, and uh, it's such a pleasure to, uh, to answer them. Keep them coming. The final bar at stockcharts.com is the best way to get your questions to us via email. On Twitter, just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. And on our YouTube channel, of course, just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We would love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer your question in our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, we had a really good time with the YouTube live Q&A earlier today. Great attendance, great questions. We, we struggled to get to all the great questions that were coming in there. Good news, though, as I mentioned, we're doing an all-mailbag show on Friday in no small part because we got so many great questions here uh, today. So if you did ask some questions, we'll make sure we incorporate them into Friday's mailbag. Make sure you tune into our next YouTube live Q&A, which will now be every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Finally, one uh, really good uh, announcement for you. Big news, the final bar will be going back live this coming Monday. We had to take it off live as we did some uh, technology changes uh, here at Stock Charts TV, but we're ready to go back uh, live. What that means is if you've been normally watching the show on delay a little bit after the close on our YouTube channel, no change. It's the same as it's always been. But if you're looking to tune in right live at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll be bringing it to you live starting this coming Monday. So you can tune into our uh, YouTube channel. You'll see the uh, placeholder for the live event. Uh, you can set a notification so you don't mix it. But right after the close, just join us on our YouTube channel called Stock Charts TV, and we will bring all of our updates and, uh, and insights live from the YouTube, uh, from the Stock Charts TV studio here in Redmond. I want to bring on today's guest, Jessica Inskip. Jessica is the Director of, Director of Education and Product at Options Play, coming to us from Jacksonville, Florida. I had the pleasure of doing a, uh, a, 
uh, a session with uh, Jessica a couple of weeks ago. And, and to be clear, it was Jessica's session and I was there to introduce and facilitate. She did a fantastic job talking about protective puts. And Jessica, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you? I'm doing great. So happy to be back. It must have been a great conversation because I got invited back right away. So thank you, Dave. <laughs> that's your that's how you know, right? It was it was good enough that we thought we need uh, the uh, our audience needs more Jessica. So I'm it's a pleasure to have you on. And and again, I was really impressed by how you explained what I think for a lot of people can be an overwhelming approach. You simplified in a very in a very uh, appropriate way, which I thought was great. Let's talk about some of the charts that you are uh, finding important today. We're starting with the Nasdaq 100. Certainly the market's sort of in a bit of a risk off turn here. When you're looking at the NDX, what stands out to you? Yeah, so I'm looking at the NASDAQ 100, and I use that as a much unpopular opinion view of the broader market because we're very much a technology-driven consumers. Market cap is certainly overtaking the S&P 500 it's because of the recent rebalancing and some of the methodology. I like the way that this serves as really as an early indicator of where the market broader markets are going. So hence the way that I've structured my charts today. Now, the way that this structure is, is a weekly intervals. I'm looking at weekly charts and I utilize the 1326 40 and 200 weekly moving averages. And I'll tell you why. 200 weekly moving average, if we were to zoom out on this chart, that gives me the overall bigger picture trend. And just like we, the way we utilize moving averages, I want to see the NASDAQ 100 in this case above that line. But in addition to that, I want to see the line sloping upwards. Now, the 13, 26, and 40, that actually represents one quarter, two quarters, and three quarters worth of prices. We look at the market from a quarterly view. We have earnings every single quarter. And you said something really great in your intro as listening in was when we fell below the 50-day moving average. You take the 13-week moving average and put it into days really close to 50. So we see the same thing actually happening here. But back to those quarterly views, what you'll notice is the previous highs before we went into the broader market downturn or downtrend was the last time that we were trading well above these averages before the current state. As soon as we fell below that, so when I see those flip over and then the NASDAQ went right below that, it then became a, an area of resistance, which we overcame and now it's new support. So there's a couple of flags here and the way that I, I look at it. So 200 weekly moving average is our bigger picture. That's sloping upwards. Secular bull trend is what I call that. The trading cycle indicating if it's bullish or bearish. And again, it's it's definitely a longer term view because we're looking at a weekly chart is still trending bullish. However, my support level that I really care about on this view is the 13 weekly moving average. And that's around 15,000 where we actually broke and closed below today, but also just started the week below it, which is really a concern. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so, really so interesting as you're as you're looking at and and I have to thank you, Jessica, because this chart, I feel like you've made a very confusing period in market history seem very straightforward and very, very reasonable. It looks like this very orderly rotation from uptrend to down from trend phase. Now that we've broken down through that uh, 13 week uh, simple moving average, where are you looking now? So that's my next line of support, which is that next horizontal line right there. Um, if you can do me the favor, Dave, of reading it off, because my screen is ever so tiny, I cannot read the number. No, you're right. Yeah, it's right around 14,100, we'll call it. Exactly. So that that's old old support or excuse me, old, old resistance, old support. That's what I'm looking for. Mm. So that was our old resistance. We broke through that. Then that 15701 level was where my red flag was. We did not, we tested that. We did not overcome it. We fell back, came below that 13 weekly moving average. And now I'm looking at that 14,000 level, which is, that's still some room to fall, but I am expecting, again, this is a weekly view. So mm. this takes time to add prices to, if you will. Right. All right. Now, let's talk to us a little bit about the equal weighted S&P. You mentioned that rebalance in the NASDAQ, which I think is a really in sort of an interesting theme that that's played out through the course of, uh, you know, just the last couple months here. What does the equal weighted S&P tell you about the conditions here? So this is where I really think everything is playing out. And we were talking about this earlier. It gives me deja vu of where the broader market or the S&P 500 was a couple of quarters ago when we were just stuck in that consolidation phase. What I see here with the S&P equal weight is 
broadening out. We are absolutely in consolidation. We're not making higher highs. There is a failure of a higher high. However, we do have higher lows. And when we're looking at higher highs or that consistent, if we were to draw a straight line on that 63.21 level, that is going to be also an old support for the old highs, just like the previous chart in the NASDAQ 100 that we were looking at, which tells me that it is an area of strong, strong supply. Do we have enough demand to overcome that supply? And the answer to that was no. So therefore, what I want to see is that rotation. If we think about more of the broader portfolio composition and requirements for hedge funds and, and really large institutional portfolios, they won't have more than 10% in one security, which is why I want to see some broadening out. And the way that I'm going to see that broadening out would be via the equal weight. I want to see more participation, if you will. And I want to see that 6321 level to be overcome, to have more of that broadening out before we would add more positions to that NASDAQ 100. So this is where everything really rhymes and comes together. This is my indicator for understanding if there is broader participation before we see the NASDAQ 100 go back into its rally mode. Mm, interesting to see the NASDAQ and then obviously the equal weighted S&P both kind of pulling back here, rotating lower. Finally, your chart of the S&P 500. We're testing the 50-day, the 13-week EMA here uh, this week. Where do you see the, uh, the, the most, uh, I guess, most widely followed benchmark here today? Yeah, so my next support level for this one is 44.12, which is one of those lower highs actually the lower high for that downtrend to the low. So it's very interesting if you think about seasonality that we're looking at the support level of the lower high that was the October low. I find that very interesting. But prior to that downturn, that 45.45 level, the older high for the, the larger bull market, that is another area of large large supply and there wasn't enough demand to overcome that. And if you think about that level in the broader market and trends and the way that we look at it, or the way that I marry trends, really the technical with the broader economic picture, it's the strongest point of resistance, in my opinion, because a higher high over those highs that we have prior to this restrictive Fed cycle is a very difficult and stronger resistance zone to overcome purely from that psychological aspect. If you have securities at that position, you probably are breaking even because there is a large area of supply, a lot of securities. There's not enough demand to overcome that. Therefore, that's why we had that fail. So it's going to be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. This also has the same structure that I positioned the NASDAQ 100 with the 132640 weekly moving averages. And you can also see how this plays out as an area of support, in which case we are we have fallen below. But what I'm going to look for is we're not the end of the week. I want to see if we will close above or below that support line. Mm. Uh, it's really, really helpful, Jessica. Now, I'd love to, you mentioned, uh, you know, a bit of seasonality talking about the October lows. We're kind of into that seasonally weaker part of the year. How much does seasonality and, and weaker seasonality here in the fall play into this overall uh, assessment of markets kind of testing support? I, I think it, we absolutely have to pay attention to it, especially if we go back to the previous 12 months. Seasonality has held true the vast majority of the time. And then if you marry that with really what happens throughout each month, we have back to school. All of a sudden, we see consumer discretionary doing a little bit better on a broader sense, um, which is odd to think about if we are considering a larger downturn in the market or health of the consumer if discretionary spending is holding up or retail is doing a little bit better, led by Amazon, and surprisingly enough, the security that is the poll, I, I think that's important to pay attention to, but it also really goes hand in hand with the way that seasonality works. We have Santa Claus rallies for a reason because there's lots of buying for Christmas. So just thinking about that, I, I think seasonality absolutely is important to pay attention to. There is a reason why the markets are consistently up or down. And there's a reason why this is consistently a challenging environment. It starts really, really well because of back to school. The retail, as we get into summer, we have to prepare for that. But then we have this area that is absolutely challenging and I'm sending my son back to school and now I'm busy and I'm not spending as much. So it really does 
makes sense if you think about it, the way the consumer reacts within certain, certain months. Yeah. Jessica, we'll have to leave it there. Listen, this was a pleasure. Thanks for bringing some weekly charts, a little bit more about the, the structure of the market, really putting you know, this recent sell-off into proper context. Thanks again for joining us. Stay safe. Be well there in Florida. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Dave. That's Jessica Insip. Uh, Jessica is the Director of uh, Option, uh, excuse me, Education and Product at Options Play, coming to us from Jacksonville, Florida. I mentioned the video we did uh, together, and really it was Jessica's work. I was there to, to introduce and facilitate. She did a brilliant job describing protective puts. We were joking before we started. Pretty good time to be talking about protective puts before things start to get a little more, uh, you know, a little less constructive here. So I make sure you check out that video if you miss it. Also, I meant to uh, ask Jessica, I would encourage you to check out. She does have a great podcast called Market Make Her, M-A-K-E-H-E-R. You can find out on more information anywhere you listen to podcasts, but really good job breaking down investing into basic fundamental building blocks. So if you have uh, uh, younger people in your family, people that uh, are learning to invest and just getting started, point them there if you could. Great take there uh, by Jessica and Skeep at uh, Options Play. We've got to wrap this show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. When we look at breadth conditions, there's so many different ways we can characterize breadth and that we can describe it. Uh, you know, we talk about the uh, stocks above moving averages. We've talked about the McClellan oscillator. We've talked about bullish percent indexes using uh, you know, point and figure data to try to measure uh, changes in trends. Here I'm keeping it simple. Uh, Larry Williams was speaking at the Money Show uh, as I was last week, and he spoke a little bit about basic measures of uh, breadth using advanced decline data, and I think that's well put. If you look at the S&P breaking below its 50-day uh, moving average this week, we can see the New York Stock Exchange, large cap, mid cap, small cap AD lines all threatening to break down below their 50-day moving average. A couple of them have actually done so as of today's close. Others appear very close to doing so. I have very subjectively color-coded these indicators green, meaning bullish, until we break the 50-day, which means I am sharpening my uh, mouse, getting ready to uh, poke in there and change it from bullish green to more neutral amber. And I think that's kind of where we're probably going to end up this week if we see further deterioration through the end of this week. Chart number two, looking at utilities, I thought uh, Jessica Inskeep's uh, comments with the weekly charts, really helpful. Thinking about market structure and how the short-term pullback really fits into the longer-term structure, you can see how the longer-term trend's still pretty constructive. And so on a day like today where I see utilities as the number one sector, I immediately want to look at longer-term data and just think about the trend in relative performance. There is no denying looking at a weekly chart of the utility sector, the XLU, which I'm doing here. This is a chart I like to feature uh, on my monthly chart review for my premium members at Market Misbehavior. You can see that the relative strength line for the utility sector in 2023 has been down, and it's not much up off of the lows, even with the day like today and this week, where it's actually having a decent week. You have to remember, this is a downtrend that has been in play for quite some time. So while there may be some opportunity for utilities to improve, I'm not seeing a big rotation into defensive area of the market uh, like utilities just yet. I think the relative strength still favoring other parts of the market. Finally, and not to finish the show on a uh, low note, but I have to notice as I'm scanning for stocks making new swing highs and new swing lows earlier today is about a two to one ratio, new lows over new highs, which is kind of a change. We've usually had way more new highs than new lows. That's starting to pivot as you see stocks breaking down. I'm highlighting two charts uh, creating or I think confirming today what I would argue pretty classic head and shoulders topping pattern. This is Duolingo in the technology sector, the highs surrounded by lower highs, breaking the neckline this week, actually uh, recently, and then retesting and now failing uh, again. LVS, Las Vegas Sands win. A number of these stocks really rotating lower this week, but you can see uh, LVS, maybe a classic, what we call a complex head and shoulders, which is a head, multiple left shoulders, multiple right shoulders, but again, a breakdown of the neckline, really completing that rotation. Charts like this are becoming more common. Again, along with everything else, I think validating sort of a risk-off thesis for stocks here. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. As a reminder, all of our previous interviews with Jessica Inskeep and many other knowledgeable uh, analysts and experts are on our YouTube channel. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.